Chapter Eighteen of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen. You wait and see. Line was washing the tea dishes. Daisy was trying patiently to sell a pink cashmere cloak to a small miss for her small dolly, and was finding the customer very hard to suit. Ben was waiting for Line and drying the spoons and plates while he waited and the express wagon passed the end window there goes the express said line how i wish it would stop here it hasn't stopped since daisy's children came i never had an express package in my life i'll send you one as soon as i can bring it to pass said ben carefully drying a plate as he spoke are you particular at all as to what shall be in it line laughed i don't know that i am she said almost anything that could possibly come in a package would be acceptable but i do think ben it would be real fun to live as miss webster does why she has an express almost every day the loveliest three-cornered bundles and all sorts of bundles be willing to change places with her and sit there and wait for bundles ben asked significantly line shivered of course not she said promptly doesn't it seem too hard that she cannot walk at all and yet she is the very happiest person i ever knew i really think and line's face took on a shade of gravity over some thought which she seemed not to care to express ben asked no questions he almost knew what she was thinking of and although he talked freely with line on every other subject for some reason he too chose to be silent here in fact he changed the whole tone of the conversation quickly with a vague fear that line would probe what he was not yet ready to talk about let's plan for school next fall line without any fail line in her astonishment dropped the bowl she was washing so suddenly that a drop of the dishwater plashed into ben's face plan for school why how can we go to school next fall any better than we did this winter i don't know the how yet said ben sturdily what i say is let's plan for it it is time we went i really don't see how we are going to get along any longer without going and if we can't why we might as well be making our plans that way line laughed a little bitterly perhaps at this her cheeks were redder than before but she went on with her bowl washing even waiting to say i don't see why scalded milk wants to stick so before she made any more direct response then she said you are as queer a boy ben bryant as i ever knew here you talk about planning and about what we cannot get along without as though all we had to do was to decide that a thing must be done and get ready for it well isn't that so ben asked don't we believe on the whole that if a thing ought to be done it will be and if it is to be of course we ought to get ready for it mother believes so said line low-toned and thoughtful again and ben felt that he was edging very near to the subject about which he was not yet ready to talk and was much relieved that there came just then a queer shuffling noise at the street door which made line ask a startled question what was that i don't know i am sure sounds as though someone was trying to make a call and had forgotten how to knock but even as he spoke there was a distinct tap 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 not on the door but apparently on the step yet it sounded like an imitation knock it is a tramp said line still startled there have been two along to-day what shall we do ben the door isn't locked and mother is out you know why we'll open the door and see what is wanted ben said boldly it is not likely that any one wants to hurt us i'll take care of you line so without more ado he stepped toward the door a trifle glad if the truth must be told that he was the sole protector of the family at a moment when there might be some sort of an intruder sure enough there was line gave a scream the moment she saw him but not of fright it is eben she declared oh ben he knocked with his tail and he has something in his mouth a package of some sort 
ben he is an express man and he has stopped at our door it looks like it said ben come in sir happy to see you how do you do shake hands old fellow what have you here something for us he bent down to the delighted dog who promptly yielded up the string with which the package was securely tied it must be for me said ben or eben would not give it up he has been told to bring it to me i wonder what it can be perhaps miss webster has sent you some work and sent eben to me because she thought you might be afraid of him she knows i'm not afraid of eben said line stooping to pat him nice old fellow shake hands now give me a kiss you need not be afraid of getting into trouble by kissing me eben and i are very intimate friends ben why don't you open your package and see what is wanted but ben seemed to be having all he was capable of managing in studying the outside of the package there is something written he had said as he stepped toward the lamp there he stood staring at it his cheeks ablaze and his eyes shining listen to this he said at last eben webster pays his respects to benjamin foster bryant and would like to have him accept the enclosed as a slight token of his gratitude in standing up for eben when he tried to offer courtesies to a little friend and was so cruelly misunderstood that is every word there is line no name signed and i don't know the writing it isn't miss webster's what do you suppose can be in the package and who sent it i should guess that judge dunmore sent it line said laughing at her brother's excited tones and blazing face and i should think the quickest way to find out what was in the package would be to open it and see it is certainly for you eben gave it to you and your full name is on it miss webster must know about it for she asked me only yesterday what your middle name was open it ben quick before daisy comes in perhaps there will be something in it for a surprise for her by this time ben's trembling fingers were tugging at the strong cord it yielded at last to skilful management then layer after layer of paper was unwrapped it must be something very precious line said under her breath and almost wishing she had called daisy to enjoy the delight of seeing a bundle opened there were so few bundles to open in that house save those which wrapped plain sewing or articles to be laundered still if it should be a surprise for daisy because in another week would come her birthday at last a fine hardwood box highly polished and fitted with a nickel plate spring lock came into view and their excitement and curiosity were greater than before what a pretty thing said line do you know how to open it ben there must be something very cunning inside yes said ben mr reynolds had a box something like it which opened with a secret spring and he showed me how whereupon he touched the spring the lid flew open disclosing the queerest little paper packages which being unwrapped gave line no more light than she had before what in the world can it be she said have you the least notion ben it makes me think of the telegraph office i don't know why i'm sure can it be something to use to work with you know ben it isn't any kind of a writing machine is it the sympathetic voice had sunk into a whisper and then hushed into respectful silence for ben his fingers trembling so that he could scarcely work was yet working with lightning speed and the blood was racing back into his face reaching to his very hair it was evident that he knew or guessed what the thing was and knew what to do with it not a word did he speak but in less time than it takes me to write the words he had unlocked the neat little creature from its box set it on the table adjusted a curious contrivance that line begged him not to touch lest he might put it out of order or get hurt dived into his pocket for a piece of paper drawn it forth slipped it under a tiny roller taken an innocent-looking knob in charge and drawn forth from the small object a series of little ticking sounds which were to him sweeter than any music he ever heard 
then drawing out the paper as suddenly as he had slipped it in he held it before line's astonished eyes and said in a voice in which emotion and exultation blended very queerly that is what it is line and there printed before her very eyes in neat clear characters were the words caroline foster bryant she withdrew her fascinated eyes as soon as she could and fixed them on her brother's face it's a typewriter he said speaking huskily now a little brand new typewriter and it's for me it said so on the wrapper didn't it oh line there was great excitement in the bryant home for the remainder of the evening daisy deserted her store altogether only leaving the curtain drawn to be sure of seeing any possible customer and was allowed to print the names of seven of the dollies on the wonderful machine she picked out the letters with laborious care but ben who discovered in less than five minutes that the ones most used were gathered into a centre of about an inch square exclaimed in glee that he almost knew its lettering already only look line how it is arranged here are and of and there and this and i don't know how many other words which one uses all the time grouped in this tiny white centre here is do and it and is and her see yes said line i see the vowels are all there so of course they are the ones which are repeated constantly and the capital of each letter is just above it all the way along do you notice that sure enough ben said taking his eyes from the machine long enough to bestow a glance of admiration on his sister what a girl you are to see into things line i never show you anything new but you make me wish you could go right and straight into school and stay there until you graduated or go in a balloon to the moon to study astronomy line said laughing gaily to smother a sigh which she was determined should not be heard you are certainly the wildest boy to wish that i know it is fortunate that when you go to doing you come down from the clouds and show good hard sense you wait until some of the wishes come to pass ben said with a wise nod of his head meantime daisy had come closer and was making grave investigation where are the fowls she asked at last where are what the fowls i heard line say that the fowls were all here in this little white place ben went off into a tempest of laughter while line hastened to explain vowels darling not fowls don't you know what vowels are no said daisy gravely i never heard of them what are they and what do you do with them how did you think any fowls got into so little a space as this daisy linda ben asked his eyes twinkling with fun this little sister was so quaint and delicious that ben could never resist the temptation to cross-question even though she looked unusually grave as she did just now over the laugh raised at her expense i did not know she said raising reproachful eyes to his face but i could think of some way there were some people once you know very smart people too who used to make pictures to stand for words and i thought perhaps there were some little bits of pictures on this writing machine that meant long words and took up less room than they would that's an idea said ben where's m i wonder line do you see m oh here it is not an inch away from my finger and he ticked down an m in the sentence he was writing what people are so cute as that daisy linda and what pictures did they use ever so many pictures and the real things sent them you know to talk for them oh it was a long time ago three or four hundred years before jesus came down here to live there was a king named alex who was taxed to pay a thousand gold eggs to another king do you know the story ben not a bit said ben gravely printing away on his typewriter the while tell it daisy linda why alex said he wouldn't and the other king his name was darius 
sent a bat and a ball and a bag of little seeds to alex now what do you suppose they meant haven't the least idea ben said glancing up with a perplexed face do you know line no said line is this a made-up story daisy or a truly one oh it is true enough ben said quickly a little shade passing over his face she is talking about darius of the persian army i know so much but what about the bat and ball and bag of seeds daisy he had to study out what they meant said daisy and he did the bat and ball were to make fun of alex for being so young and the bag of little bits of seeds was to make him think what a very great army darius had and how foolish it was in him to try to resist it alex was smart too he understood it and sent back an answer in the same way how asked both listeners at once and daisy much gratified proceeded to tell he struck the ball hard with his bat to show that it was the way he meant to strike the part of the ball on which darius lived and he gave the seeds to a fowl who ate them up this showed how he meant to destroy darius's army then he sent him back a wild melon which is very bitter and by this darius was to understand what bitter trouble was coming to him miss webster told me the story and there are ever so many more i suppose it was remembering about the fowl which made me think that line said fowl instead of vowel now show me the vowels please and tell me what they are for the vowels said ben speaking almost respectfully are those five letters so close together a e i o u see how easy it is to make them without moving my hand but a little bit those are the important letters because one of them at least is in every word we speak why said daisy in great surprise i didn't think that are you sure ben pretty sure try it think of a word which hasn't one of them in it dolly said daisy promptly oh no that has an o in it well there's heaven why that has two of them i'll take a little bit of a word cat no that won't do or it nor why ben i can't think of one how funny why do you call them vowels i don't know said ben humbly they belong to a long list of i don't knows it is longer than any other list in the world Dazelinda, and i want to try to make it shorter i'm at it every day and queerly enough every day it seems to grow longer oh no said daisy earnestly it can't grow longer because all the things there are to know god thought of ever so long ago and there aren't any new ones only he lets us keep finding them out i think it is nice and the list really does grow shorter every time we learn something i thought about that and miss webster said it was so i mean to ask her how those five little letters came to be in all words and why they are named vowels don't you like to know reasons for things ben ben was riding hard and fast by this time and only nodded his reply from this time on the interest centered entirely on the wonderful new machine and the marvels it could do line in her excitement lighted another lamp thereby startling her mother very much when she came from the house around the corner where she had been sitting with the baby by the flood of light in the little home something must have happened sure enough she found that something had and was quite as eager and pleased as even ben could desire but when daisy was gone to bed and the mother had gone to see that she was tucked away comfortably ben said to line still writing while he talked line there are three of us as sure as the world to think of that mouse getting interested in ancient history and knowing about darius and the persians knowing more about them actually than you and i it will never do in the world we must go to studying and we must educate her she thought out that about there being nothing new because god had thought of it before did you notice that daisy is made of uncommon stuff i tell you and she's got to have an education 
and this blessed little machine has got to help me earn one for her i don't see how line said stopping in her sewing which she had finally made herself sit down to to look over the worker's shoulder you can't get any work to do on it can you work that will pay money i mean even after you learn i don't know i'm going to learn i know that and then try for it mr reynolds thought i could if i had a big machine and i don't know why i couldn't do it on here as well not so fast though you can't use both hands well i don't actually write with but one hand at a time on the other i don't know what i can do till i try all i know is that i mean to try judge dunmore must have thought it was a fine thing or he wouldn't have bought it and he is the one who must have done it besides i know it is a fine thing i feel it all through me line i know where every letter is already and see how quick i can write t h e r e if a fellow can learn to write one word quickly it stands to reason that he can all the others if he practices long enough i wonder why they called it the century line said thoughtfully did they how do you know is that the name on that card good i like that it is the discovery of the century maybe it is the finest one which has come to me anyhow line i feel in my bones that i'm going to accomplish something with this you wait and see end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen tenths one morning there came to daisy bryant a troubled thought truth to tell it had come to her mother and sister before this but they had said nothing to daisy this was the way it came to her you will remember that her store occupied the large window which fronted the street ben had put up a shelf there and the rows of dollies were most tastefully arranged with a view to showing off their wardrobes to the best advantage each morning they had to be rearranged dusted and the netting veil which protected them from soil carefully draped over them on the morning in question daisy was engaged in this lovely work when she became aware that a pair of very earnest eyes were watching most closely these belonged to as queer a little creature as she had ever seen a wee chunk of a girl bareheaded with a white handkerchief knotted about her neck in some odd fashion on her arm she held a bundle tied up in white and with the other hand she grasped an enormous umbrella on her head was a something which daisy could not fit to a name it certainly was not a bonnet nor yet a cap but it seemed to take the place of these things in the mind of the little woman who wore it apparently she had been left on guard for a very large basket of the sort used for packing peaches stood near her while boxes and bundles of various shapes and sizes were stacked around it as for the small woman herself she seemed to have lost all knowledge or at least thought of these and was absorbed in staring at daisy or rather at the dollies with the most wistful and at the same time sorrowful look on her face that daisy had ever seen she paused in her work irresolute as to what she ought to do and finally smiled on the gazer her mother did not like to have her speak to the strange children who so often stopped at the window but it could certainly do no harm to smile at them especially at this one who was evidently very strange indeed to the town and the town's ways she was rewarded for her smile it was instantly returned so broad a smile that it widened out the odd little face in a way that almost startled daisy the next thing she did was to bow a very timid little bow which was answered by a series of delighted nods then daisy went for her mother mrs bryant opened the door and stepped out good morning little girl she said pleasantly are you waiting for somebody the smile faded and a startled frightened look took its place but seeming to be reassured by the kind face of the lady she poured out a torrent of bewildering words 
what does she say asked daisy in astonishment i do not know my dear she is a little german girl i think she must just have come into town on the early train perhaps she has evidently been left to take care of the things while somebody went back i cannot understand a word she says daisy mother said daisy earnestly what a pity nothing can be said to her and she looks lonesome and half afraid she can smile though i smiled at her and she answered that right away yes said mrs bryant smiling in her turn i have often thought what a blessed thing it was that people could smile in english well dear come in we cannot help her any and perhaps she does not like to be gazed at mother said daisy following her mother's steps somewhat reluctantly it doesn't seem quite nice to come in and leave her standing outside there it isn't quite quite hospitable is it why said mrs bryant laughing outright i do not know that we are called upon to be hospitables to strangers passing by oh yes we are mother don't you remember the stranger within thy gates it speaks of them particularly mother i am almost sure she wants a dolly her eyes said it almost plainer than her mouth could i don't think she has any dolly at all because if they are travelling and she has just come from the train she would have it along you know if she had one oh mother you said she was a german could i not give her my greta from over the seas would not she be a lovely tenth for this stranger within thy gates as usual mrs bryant was greatly in doubt whether to laugh or cry over the sweet quaint ideas of this quaint little daughter would you be willing to give greta away she asked at last and to a stranger why mother she would be a tenth you know and this stranger would love her i am sure greta would have to go where they would love her that is the reason i have not been willing to sell her because she is not pretty you know like the others and some children would poke fun at her i shouldn't like that may i give her to the little german mother see she is standing there yet and her eyes why they talk just as plainly don't you see them mrs bryant certainly saw them most hungry-looking eyes they were they seemed fairly to devour the dollies in the window was it fancy or actual fact that they lingered most lovingly on that square-shouldered stolid-looking greta from over the seas the dutch dolly to whom daisy had clung most obstinately although the harding children had wanted to get her for a maid for their florinda and gabrielle and even d had hinted once that perhaps she might like to buy her why did daisy want to give her to this round-faced wondering-eyed strange-looking little foreigner why do you wish to give greta to her dear she asked gently why not one of the others mother said daisy with a penetrating look she would love greta the most of any of them i feel in my heart that she would and i have not found anybody before not even d whom i thought would love greta enough mrs bryant resisted the inclination to laugh again and gave instant consent if the doll was a tenth why should not the one who offered it bestow it where she would perhaps said this mother to her heart as she watched the tender way in which greta was removed from her corner of the shelf perhaps the child is taught of one who is wiser than we and who does actually accept the gift as coming in his name greta was caressed and kissed very tenderly some whispered words followed for only her large cloth ear and then wrapped in the newest cloak among the pile of fresh ones which had come from lines skilful touches only yesterday daisy hastened out mrs bryant watched from the window what a delicious pantomime it was daisy's sweet shy ways her gentle explanatory words accompanied by the better understood gestures the child's bewildered gaze her blue eyes seeming to speak for her to ask what in the world do you mean do you mean to let me hold the dolly a minute so much she comprehended the umbrella was dropped without ceremony 
it lay prone on the ground while greta was clasped in eager arms and received the most rapturous hugs and the most passionate kisses that mrs bryant had ever beheld poor little hungry heart she said and brushed the mist from before her eyes there seemed to be no fear as to greta's being loved enough there came presently with rapid strides and arms laden down with bundles two germans a stalwart man and woman these halted before the two children and surveyed them both with astonishment the rapture faded from the little german's eyes and with slow reluctant hands she made ready to give greta back to her owner the woman talking volubly to her the while in words which daisy could not understand oh no said daisy earnestly do not give her back she is for you she has come to be your little girl you must take her home and love her the woman turned to her with a torrent of words causing daisy to stare and look half frightened then mrs bryant opened the door with words which she seemed to think could be understood they were spoken so slowly and chosen so carefully she repeated daisy's wish only bewilderment on the part of the mother at last the father stepped forward was gibt he said keep wird sie break geweis gegeben it was all very comical the bowing and gesticulating the rapid sentences hurled at her in german the few broken english words which the man occasionally ventured but at last they understood and bowed and smiled and made hands and tongues go the man took off his hat and the woman waved two umbrellas and all of them laughed and the child hugged and kissed greta with resounding eloquence and at last they all tramped away line who had come to the window to enjoy the scene was almost overpowered with laughter but daisy was sweetly grave she had given her tenth and it had been joyfully received and she was glad but at the same time greta was gone and she had been so much afraid that nobody would love the little dutch dolly that it had ended by her bestowing much love and tenderness upon her and it was not in daisy's heart not to miss her beside and that beside covered the most of daisy's gravity another thought had come to her of such moment that it was no wonder she looked after a little not only grave but perplexed what is it dear her mother asked gently she understood her young daughter's changing face and had come to respect a great many of her thoughts mother i have given away my last tenth what am i to do now mother and elder daughter exchanged glances it was the tenth of which daisy thought but they had thought and said to each other several times during the last few days that the stock of dollies was lessening very rapidly and when they were gone what was this little woman of business to do she was evidently becoming deeply interested in her work and it was really surprising how full her little bank was getting of silver pieces the doll business was certainly one not to be despised at least where all the dolls were gifts costing nothing but how was the stock to be replenished various plans between the mother and line had been discussed and abandoned even ben had taken part in the discussion with interest but the farthest that any of them had reached was to wonder what daisy would say or do when she realized the situation and whether they would better talk with her about it or leave the knowledge to dawn upon her through the force of circumstances not one of them had thought of the tenths but this was daisy's first anxiety she moved toward the window and surveyed her family with that thoughtful perplexed air no she said gravely greta was my last tenth or that is i had not thought of making her a tenth i thought it would be florimel but i could feel that this little girl would not approve of her and would like greta very much indeed so she had to go now florimel was the most elegant both in dress and general appearance of all the dollies left and would without doubt have brought the largest price 
certainly daisy was not offering the lame or the sick for sacrifice what am i to do she repeated i cannot go on with this business without some help we must think over it said mrs bryant gently and talk it over with our friends perhaps and there she paused perhaps what mother never mind dear we will think over it as i said and see what can be done to add to the stock if that is considered best in the light of daisy's grave anxiety not as to the general stock in trade so much as the sacred tents much of the talk which she and line had held about it seemed almost sordid to the mother's eyes perhaps she thought again for the dozenth time this little flower of mine is really taught of god and he will help her to think what to do at any rate she did not feel ready to touch the subject daisy however could not get away from it her anxiety once roused would not slumber again until she had resolved what to do she said no more but the thoughtful look on her small face deepened rather than lessened as the hours passed and when early in the afternoon she asked and received permission to call on miss webster line engaging to look carefully after the business while she was gone her mother looked after her with a relieved smile and said to line she has reached a second stage in her problem and is willing to consult with miss webster i am glad she has found so wise a friend to unburden her heart to mother said line did you ever see so queer a child as daisy she is so grown up sometimes and so entirely a baby at other times a little while ago when she was wiping the spoons and forks she drew two or three heavy sighs which went to my heart and i asked her what was troubling her and why she did not talk with you about it mother was very busy this morning i said and could not talk but now she will be sitting down sewing and you can plan out some way of adding to the dollies i do not want to talk with mother yet she said and i cannot tell you how sweet and yet grave her voice was she has such burdens now line that i do not want to make my dollies into another if they cannot be a help they ought to be all given away when i get something thought out mother will help me do it but i do not want to take the trouble part to her now that is not in the least like a child is it sometimes it troubles me i do not know said mrs bryant smiling though there were tears in her eyes daisy's sweet unselfish thoughtfulness for mother and for everybody even the little dutch stranger within the gates may be like a child who lives very close to jesus may it not i think that is what our daisy does and line was silent at miss webster's daisy found d she had herself introduced the two and was not in the least jealous but very happy over the fact that they were evidently destined to be very intimate friends i was on my way to your store said d opening the door for daisy at miss webster's request and i stopped to consult miss webster about something are you going to stay daisy a little while said daisy if miss webster is ready for me i came to consult her too these two little girls though wonderfully unlike in many respects were kindred spirits in this that both were extremely fond of choice words especially if they were rather longer than was common to children of their age with d this was a sense of largeness a vague impression that such language added to her years and dignity with daisy it was an outgrowth of her intense longing for an education she carefully treasured every new and as she said interesting word she heard printed it in her notebook consulted the small worn dictionary as to its meaning and felt after each acquisition that she had added to her treasures so now though miss webster smiled over the language neither of the children realized that it was unusual and the important subject which was lying heavy on daisy's heart was forthwith introduced d assuring her that she might speak first because hers was longer 
and to tell the truth was a piece of it a secret even from daisy mine is not a secret said daisy gravely because everybody who can count will soon know about it i think i will have to close up business miss webster and it is that i came to talk about is it possible said that lady in great surprise oh i hope not i was looking forward to the days when the mud would be all gone and i could ride out in my wheeled chair and select a dolly for my niece from your store i am afraid you cannot said daisy with a mournful shake of her head i am afraid they will all be gone before the mud is i did not once imagine that so many dollies could go away so soon but i have not a single tenth left and that will tell you how few there are beside i cannot do business without any tenths certainly not said miss webster with instant sympathy and daisy breathed a sigh of relief it was so pleasant to be understood end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty getting ready for the fair why don't you take the money you have made from the sale of dollies and buy more broke in d after the matter had been laid before them and discussed for a few minutes that is the way they do isn't it miss webster people who go into business always use the money they make to buy more things don't they i know they do that is business papa explained it to me slowly and gravely daisy shook her head i cannot do that she said it is appropriated even d opened her eyes wide over this long word and looked perplexed while miss webster made a little cough to hide a smile and questioned can you explain to us daisy dear just what your plan has been d is quite right about the business part of it the custom is to use a certain amount of the returns from business in increasing the stock and in small business enterprises a very large proportion of the sum made has to be used in this way else as you can readily see the stock would be exhausted after a little miss webster had purposely used a number of very business-like words in expectation of questions concerning them but daisy's trouble seemed not to lie in that direction she evidently understood exactly what miss webster meant yet looked distressed but dear miss webster she said i cannot do that i went into business for a certain purpose i could never have consented to sell my dollies at all except for a very important reason i needed the money in fact it had to be earned and this was the only way i could think of to help but if i have to spend almost all of it in buying more dollies that will not be helping why yes it will said d promptly that is the way they have to do isn't it miss webster she doesn't understand business does she my father is a lawyer you know and i suppose it makes the difference daisy let me tell you about it just as papa told me suppose you had a dollar and bought ten dollies with it that was the way papa said they would have to be very cheap common little dollies you know but they do have ten cent dollies well and you dressed them up and made them look pretty so that they were worth twenty cents apiece and you sold them all then you would have two dollars and suppose you put twenty cents of that money away for tenths i always give tenths myself only i give it in money that is easier than to do it with dollies i think don't you and then suppose you laid away twenty cents more for a fund to use whenever you had to buy things for yourself you know and with all that was left you bought more dollies you would have let me see papa said sixteen dollies i think yes i'm sure he did and you would sell them and make more money and divide it and buy some more and keep on doing that and by and by you would have a large fund don't you see the name of that is capital i don't know why i am sure but that's what they call it and it grows 
but i can't wait for it to grow said distressed daisy i need the money right away all i have made and a great deal more if i could get it then you will have to fail said d solemnly but not without an undertone of satisfaction there was something very businesslike and interesting in the idea of a failure in business i know how they do that too daisy when they can't go on with their business and pay their bills you know why they just have to fail not always said miss webster who felt it was quite time to come to the relief of her sorrowful eyed daisy whose lip was beginning to quiver sometimes there are friends who assume the liabilities d did you ever hear that word used daisy my dear can you tell us how much money is needed to be secured before you can make any further investment daisy turned grave eyes upon her and spoke slowly i think i have been very silly miss webster i did not think it all out beforehand i do not understand business very well anyway not nearly so well as d does and i wanted to help about the mortgage that was why i went into business i thought i could make a good deal towards it enough so that perhaps mother could pay what they call the interest right away so it wouldn't worry her any more but it seems it takes a very great deal of money and then it begins growing again the interest does or coming again i don't understand it but that is what ben said and there doesn't seem to be any way out of it poor little woman of business there were tears glistening in her eyes by this time and her voice broke almost before she reached that last word mortgage echoed d respectfully she had heard of those creatures only in the dim distance she had immense respect for them as creatures of great power capable of causing an immense amount of trouble she knew that men who were closeted with her father in his private office by the hour sometimes used the word in the gloomiest of tones if daisy had to do with mortgages she was getting beyond her depth privately she resolved to consult her father at the first opportunity i understand said miss webster cheerily and you want to save the thirty dollars you have made towards paying the interest that is a very thoughtful little woman of business certainly but then there is really no opportunity for failing because you see you are not in debt oh yes ma'am said daisy earnestly mother is that is the word that makes the mortgage yes i know but i mean you as a business woman are not in debt that is it is not the dull business which has made the trouble what we need is a little more capital without investing that already made how would it do to have a fair a fair echoed both girls at once yes a doll's fair a few years ago there was one in boston it was held in a large room and hundreds upon hundreds of dollies came to be exhibited there were six prizes given for the most tastefully dressed dollies and the neatest sewing i have a photograph of the room taken after all the dollies were arranged hand me that large book d at your right and i will show you the photograph for the next fifteen minutes both girls were absorbed in a study of the picture with its endless display of dollies of every size and style then they began to ask questions what did they have a doll's fair for who sent all the dollies what did they do with them afterwards who gave prizes and what were the prizes how did they make any money by it how could we get up a dolly's fair this last required a long answer the entire question was thoroughly discussed in fact the short spring afternoon was drawing toward dusk before everything was settled but it was settled at last subject of course to the approval of daisy's mother there was to be a dolly's fair in that very town it was to be held in miss webster's own rooms every little girl in town was to be invited to put her pet dolly on exhibition ten cents was to be charged for the privilege of seeing the dollies 
and Daisy and Dee and Daisy's sister Caroline, and Miss Webster herself, were to spend all their leisure time during the three weeks that must elapse before they were ready for the fair, in making up articles for sale, dolls' hats and slippers and fans and parasols and sacks and capes and dresses and nightgowns. It was certainly a wonderful scheme, and Daisy became so interested in it and so eager over it that she almost forgot the mortgage. Not so D. She had not gotten both arms out of her street sack before she began at her father. Papa, what is a mortgage? A mortgage? repeated Judge Dunmore. Generally speaking, it is a very disagreeable and troublesome document to the parties chiefly concerned. I know so much, Papa, but what is it, and what is it for? Why, said the judge, we will suppose that you owe me ten dollars. "'Oh, dear,' said D. "'I am so glad that I don't.' "'And you cannot pay me at present, but you promise to do so at some future time, say in a year, giving me interest meantime for the use of my money. You understand about interest?' "'Yes, sir,' said D. "'I would have to give you six cents for every dollar. That would be sixty cents, wouldn't it?' "'That would depend upon the state you lived in.' Each state settles what shall be its legal or lawful interest. In this state, six per cent is allowed. I might be what is called a sharp man, and take advantage of your wanting the money very badly, and say to you that I wouldn't lend it for less than eight or even ten per cent interest. But I do not believe I will, for that is not an honorable thing to do, so we will say six per cent. That is, six cents for every hundred, so that at the end of a year you will owe me ten dollars and sixty cents. But how am I to be sure that you will have any money to pay me within a year? I must have what is called security, something to secure me from loss, even though you could not pay the money. So you give me a paper saying that your flower garden, for instance, shall be held as security for me. That is, I have a mortgage on the garden to the amount of ten dollars and sixty cents. If at the end of a year, provided that is the length of time for which you have borrowed the money, you cannot pay me, I have a right to sell your garden for whatever I can get. If it is worth fifty dollars, and I can only get ten dollars and sixty cents for it, that is your misfortune. The money is mine, and your garden is gone. Do you understand?' "'But, Papa,' said D. with wide-open eyes, "'I shouldn't think that that would be honest "'to take a thing which was worth fifty dollars "'to pay you ten dollars.' "'That depends,' said the judge. "'It might be worth fifty, "'and yet there be no person able or willing to give that sum, "'and I might need the money so much "'as to be obliged to make what people call a forced sale.' instead of waiting for a better time when some one would want to buy the garden at a reasonable price but i confess that i should not like to own your garden at such a price when i felt that it ought to be worth to you fifty dollars at the same time i should have what is called a legal right to do so if i could get no more for it and very heavy losses are often brought about in this way dishonorable people sometimes force sales and foreclose mortgages simply for the sake of getting valuable property without paying its full value. Do you understand? Yes, sir, said D with a sigh. Papa, do you know what Daisy has that is mortgaged? And will there perhaps be a forced sale on that? Daisy? Has the mouse a mortgage to trouble her? It must be one of the dollies. Then D explained the situation. "'Poor child,' said Judge Dunmore, clearing his voice, which had a husky sound. "'It must be her mother's burdens which she is trying to help carry. She is young to have so heavy an end to lift. I think we must see if we cannot help lift a little, must we not, daughter?' "'Oh, yes, sir. We are going to. We have been at work all the afternoon planning a doll's fair.' It is to be in Miss Webster's rooms, and will be just lovely. And we are to make things for sale. Miss Webster and Daisy and Line and I. 
mamma will help too i most know she will and the things will sell you know and there's the price of admission miss webster said daisy and i would have all the work so we should share the profits but i mean to give every cent of mine toward the mortgage wouldn't you papa i certainly should said judge dunmore smiling and at the same time fumbling in several pockets in search of a handkerchief that evening he went out alone and made his way with a quick step to the street where mrs bryant lived it happened that she was quite alone daisy was asleep for the night and line and ben had gone at miss webster's invitation to hear about and help plan for the wonderful fair which was to be an assured fact at as early a date as possible the judge was in no wise disappointed at finding the mother alone he had a very delicate piece of business to carry out and the fewer listeners there were the better he felt it would be for the success of his scheme it was not an easy matter to get at the situation of affairs mrs bryant was not one who paraded her troubles where there was no occasion but judge dunmore was accustomed to cross-questioning and to careful management by dint of much tact and patience he made all the discoveries he needed in addition to those which d had given him and before the steps of ben and line were heard at the door their mother held in her hand a check sufficient to cover principal and interest of that terrible debt and judge dunmore was the owner of the original mortgage instead of the man who was bent on securing the valuable lot for less than half its value only a transfer from one man to another mrs bryant at the close of that eventful evening owed exactly as much money as she had when it began yet her heart was lighter than it had been since the day when she was left a widow to struggle with her burdens d did not understand it at all she questioned and cross-questioned her father and you did not give her any money at all no indeed daughter it would have been rude to have offered her money that would have been treating her like a beggar and she is no beggar i don't see why papa if i owed a lot of money and you should give me some to pay it with i should be glad and kiss you and love you harder than ever i don't see why it wouldn't have been nice in you to give mrs bryant some judge dunmore laughed the child may take from her father he said what she may not want to from a stranger never mind daughter you will understand it some day i could not offer mrs bryant money because she is a lady and to have done so under the circumstances would have been rude then you didn't help her a bit did you papa she thinks i did i don't see how didn't you say you took that old mortgage yourself and doesn't that mean that she owes you that is what it means my child then papa won't you put it in the fire and not let her give you a cent of money oh no said judge dunmore laughing heartily that would be a very unbusinesslike way of doing it is purely a business transaction she owes me the interest and the principal and is to pay me instead of the other man that is all there is to it then i don't see how it is a bit better declared disappointed d who had felt sure that her father would make everything comfortable for her dear daisy father and mother exchanged smiles then her mother said if my little girl should ever be so unfortunate as to owe anybody she will find that to owe a good and honorable man who will not take advantage of her trouble in any way is a great deal pleasanter than to owe a bad man i shall never owe anybody a cent said the little girl with emphasis i don't like it i would never want to pay a man some money every year because i owed him and yet not have the money i gave him pay a cent of the debt it doesn't sound right just think of how daisy's mother has been paying and paying every year for ever so long and hasn't got a bit of it paid i never want to do that declared d this view of business set her father in laughter again but he sobered his face to tell her that he hoped she need never owe anybody anything 
but the debt which the Bible told about, and to assure her that Mrs. Bryant should never be pressed for the payment of the money which she now owed him. Her fine young son will pay the debt some day, he said. I haven't a doubt of it if he lives, and it is to protect his boyhood and to help him to be a manly man that I have taken the mortgage. One thing had happened during that visit of her father's to the Bryant cottage, which Dee did not yet know about, but which had been the source of almost as much joy as the transfer of the mortgage. It was after Line and Ben had returned, and the conversation had become general, that the judge turned to Ben with his question. "'Well, sir, how does the little machine behave? Are you able to make anything of it?' "'Oh, yes, sir,' said Ben, with shining eyes. "'It behaves beautifully, does everything I tell it to as fast as it can.' and he sprang up and brought his treasure from its corner on one of the study shelves, carefully removed the bright-colored bag in which it was hidden from the dust, and setting it on the table, began to write. Really, said Judge Dunmore, regarding it with keen interest, you certainly do make it talk fast. I do not see how you can have acquired such skill in so short a time. Then it is really of practical value? I was skeptical as to its being worth much for anybody but our little friend Daisy. I could see how a little one like her might learn to write and to spell, and to express ideas correctly and fluently by it, but I confess I thought that a boy of your age and acquirements would soon discover that he could do more rapid work with a pen. No, sir, said Ben decidedly. I can work pretty fast with a pen, I believe, Mr. Reynolds thinks so, but I can work a good deal faster with this already, and I haven't used it so long as I have a pen. Judge Dunmore drew from his pocket a blank sheet of paper, folded, and placed in a blank envelope. I have made so much preparation toward writing an important business letter, he said. I thought I should drop into the post office on my way back and write it ready for the early mail. What is to hinder this little instrument from doing it for me? If I dictate, will you write? There was a flush on Ben's face which mounted to his forehead, but his answer was prompt and courteous, and without more delay Judge Dunmore dictated a brief note, giving directions to one of his clerks concerning certain packages which were to be looked after. No word was spoken by the little group who watched Ben's flying fingers and flushed face. His mother was almost sorry for him. Poor Ben had had so few letters to write. How should he know where to commence or where to close? He could spell, that was a comfort certainly, but perhaps he did not know whether, dear sir, should be in the middle of the line or at the end or where. He had seen so few business letters, or letters of any sort, poor boy. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 21 – A Chance Judge Dunmore surveyed the neatly written sheet that was presently handed to him with a very critical eye. "'That is correct in every particular,' he said at last, with a satisfied air. "'Unless there should be a comma after that word, shelf. What do you think?' "'I think not, sir,' said Ben respectfully, but with decision in his tone. "'Because the sense is complete without it, and you know they do not use commas so freely now as they once did. "'Is it so?' said Judge Dunmore, smiling. "'Perhaps you are right. In any case, it is a relief to see a boy of your age who has given thought to the subject and has ideas of his own in regard to it. Most young people, and older ones too, for that matter, seem to me to tumble in the comma and semicolons wherever it happens without regard to sense. Well, what about the envelope? Will that magician address it? He can, said Ben, his eyes gleaming with pleasure and a touch of pride. The envelope was slipped into place, and the gentle tack-tack-tack of the letters began. 
a moment and it was slipped out in triumph and held before the pleased eyes of the judge upon my word he said heartily as plain as print in fact it is print what a relief that will be to the postmaster who is probably never sure whether i mean a y or an s or a t i regret to say i have fallen into a most slovenly habit of writing until i can hardly at times decipher my own notes i am not sure that i should use the term fallen into i don't think i ever learned how to write properly it has been a great regret to me ben my boy what are you doing nowadays the flush which had died out a little on ben's face deepened again i am addressing envelopes and putting up church circulars for mr holden just now he said i work at it a little while every afternoon mr holden thought it would be better to keep it for afternoon work and leave my mornings free for other chances but i haven't found any chances yet and ben tried to keep back a sigh over the last words what kind of work have you been looking for my boy anything in the world said ben earnestly which was respectable and would help along rather indefinite judge dunmore said with a quiet smile i have no doubt you intend to be very clear in your answer but the fact is the word respectable is a hard one to understand what does webster say about it i wonder i wish i knew said ben with a half laugh i will put it on my list and let you know to-morrow if that will do your list i am curious has your webster a special fit of dignity in obliging you to make out a list each time you want to consult him pray how many words does he demand at a sitting line's face was red but this was not the sort of poverty which made her brother blush he answered frankly laughing as he spoke no sir it is not an arrangement of webster's at least i think he would be more accommodating if he had a chance we have none of our own so my sister and i make out a list of any words that we want to know about and the next chance we have either at mr holden's or miss webster's we look them up ah i understand that is a very sensible idea webster is a cumbrous luxury in these days especially the pictorial unabridged as to the word respectable i think we can get at the meaning sufficiently perhaps for our purpose though accuracy in definition is a very important thing what should you say at a venture the word meant why i shouldn't think there could be any other meaning to it than just that which is wound up in the very sound of the word said ben a thing is respectable if it is proper and well the thing that ought to be done judge dunmore looked at line do you agree he asked i should think one would have to know exactly what respect meant before the word respectable could be understood she said and on the judge's face there was a quick flash of appreciation as he answered true benjamin my boy you and i stand corrected respect let us see do either or both of you study latin no sir said both in the same breath low-toned and regretful when you do you will both enjoy the study there was something very invigorating in the way he spoke those words it was as if he considered the matter in the light of one not to be questioned whereas these two had said each to himself and herself but a few days before if i can get a respectable common school education it is all i must hope for now instinctively each said inwardly i mean to study latin respect said judge dunmore is made up like so many words which we claim from two latin words and literally means to look back or look again does that give you a hint as to the original meaning something to command attention to attract notice was that the idea to be conveyed in your use of the word respectable ben no sir not at all said ben laughing if i had something to do which would be right and which would help support my family i shouldn't care whether people ever looked at it or not or at me 
then you see how difficult it is to understand words i know a boy who refused to saw wood for a man to pay a debt he had carelessly made because his father was a lawyer and it wasn't respectable work for a lawyer's son both ben and line laughed what are you laughing at asked the judge looking from one to the other curiously am i to understand that you believe he ought to have sawed the wood i should think that would depend on whether he had something else to do that was more important and that it was his duty to do instead said ben promptly and something by which he could earn money to pay his debt chimed in line of course said ben the judge smiled on them both and drew out his watch it is later than i thought he said rising we have spent so much time on the meaning of that word respectable that we haven't reached the point at which i aimed when i started are you an early riser benjamin i don't know sir said ben i get the fire built and the water over by six o'clock but i don't know whether that would be called early or not it will answer my purpose at least said judge dunmore it happens that mrs dunmore and i are the only early risers in our house at present our married daughter likes to breakfast later and as she is visiting us the young people think it is very pleasant to wait and breakfast with her so mrs dunmore and i who do not like to wait sit down alone often at half past seven and the question is whether you could come to-morrow morning and take breakfast with us at that hour and give us a chance to talk over some work that we should both consider respectable you should have seen ben's face then if it had been red before crimson is the word which ought to describe it next he looked at his mother and at line and at the floor and tried to stammer out something which he knew was unintelligible and stopped in the middle of it in utter confusion judge dunmore laughed pleasantly you do not want to come in the least do you you think it would be dreadfully embarrassing to go out to breakfast with two elderly people who are almost strangers to you and you do not believe you can eat five mouthfuls in fact you would rather go without your breakfast altogether than to have it under such circumstances at the same time you are afraid that it will be rude to decline and you do not want to be rude haven't i stated the case fairly and honestly that is about it sir said ben looking up at last his face fairly blazing at the same time he could not help laughing a little it seemed so absurd to be admitting to judge dunmore that he thought it a dreadful thing to go to his house to breakfast good said the judge heartily i like frankness and i do not think it at all surprising that a boy of your age would rather take breakfast with his own family than with some other person's family nevertheless i am going to press my invitation because i see in it an opportunity to learn some things which i wish to know will you come to breakfast benjamin yes sir said ben if my mother says so there was plenty to talk about now as soon as the door closed after the judge line began it well ben bryant in a half admiring half quizzing tone i should think you were getting on fast invited out to take breakfast with judge dunmore they say the dining-room is just lovely the chambermaid at mrs kedwin's has a sister working there and she tells wonderful things about the dishes it seems they have unpacked some of their own which they brought with them from their winter house and she says they are ever so much more elegant than the sutherland's dishes i guess the sutherland's dishes would be quite elegant enough for me ben said gloomily and then mother whatever do you suppose is the reason he wants me to come to learn some things which he wished you to know he said mrs bryant replied placidly sewing away steadily as she spoke i'd like to know what they are said ben and his face was very gloomy indeed you'll learn some things too said line i wish i had your chance i wish you had with a good deal of energy in the words what chance is there about it i'd like to know for a boy 
plenty of chance you will see things the way people have them who belong in well in society you know people who are somebodies the way they live and the way they eat and all about it and what good will that do me how do i know what a queer evening this is here i thought i was talking to my brother benjamin and behold he has changed into rufus kedwin in the last five minutes with his everlasting what good will that do over all the chances that come to him i thought you preached to him that every single thing we can learn may be of use somehow and that we ought to learn everything we could ben let his face break into a grim smile this is different he said i know it very different and unexpected and who knows what the next thing may be a different one still perhaps into which a piece of this will fit how do you know how soon you may have a chance to belong to such people yourself what people why the kind we are talking about people who live in handsome houses and have nice things every day in the week and keep on their company manners all the time ho oh, said ben i call that a jump how would i go to work to belong to such people mother do you ever suppose our line was proud i mean it said line coolly while his mother only smiled i say you don't know how soon you will be placed where you would give a good deal to know just how to act and here is a chance to learn some of the things i suppose they have great fine napkins at each plate and they spread them over their laps to keep their clothes nice they do that at mrs kedwin's you know and i suppose they have larger and nicer ones at grand houses don't they mother i should think well-brought-up people would keep their clothes clean at the table without having bibs on ben said in some disdain well they can't always things drop you see a drop of milk or even of water would spoil some dresses and sometimes the person who sits next to a lady is awkward and spills the gravy then what would become of her dress without a napkin ben laughed and his cheeks reddened yours wasn't spoiled he said no it wasn't because it is calico and will wash but i should like a napkin for every meal i wouldn't i need something more substantial mother would it be expensive to feed line on napkins three times a day it was line's turn to laugh and blush at every meal then she said if you like that better and they have little butter plates for each person and the butter is in little round balls all carved i don't know how they manage it but i saw them once i waited for miss sutherland in the dining-room while they were setting the table and i saw ever so many pretty things that i have wanted to know the name of and the use for ever since you must keep your eyes and ears open and have a good deal to teach me after to-morrow it ought to be your chance instead of mine ben said waxing into gloom again you have your ears and eyes open already to all such chances and mine are stupid in that direction i shall make some horrible blunder and disgrace you all i don't know how to wear a bib or to get anything off from a round roll of butter i won't eat any butter see if i do oh mother mother i wish i didn't have to go and the brown head went down suddenly plump into his mother's lap well you do said mrs bryant coolly and i have no doubt you will have worse things in life to do many a time you may as well get used to them as they come if i were you i would learn to be brave and manly over little things as well as great big ones these were the words hard sounding perhaps to a badly frightened boy going out to his first state breakfast alone but while she spoke the mother's hand was making soft passes through the tumbled brown hair and the pats she bestowed from time to time were tender and sympathetic on the whole ben was comforted but he could not have told why nevertheless he went the next morning with more fear and trembling than had ever fallen upon him before to meet his appointment poor ben line said looking after him half laughing half sympathetic 
he looks as though he were going out to be hanged instead of going to take breakfast with judge dunmore mother aren't boys queer i should like to go i can't tell you how much i should like it if i had a dress that just suited me to wear and was sure i looked just right i should like nothing better than to be going out to a grand house where everything was beautiful i should like to have an elegant carriage come for me and a footman to wait on me i believe i could step into a handsome carriage real gracefully i've watched miss sutherland step into theirs so often that i know just how to do it do you suppose i will ever have a chance to prove it mother mrs bryant looked at her handsome daughter whose eyes were bright with excitement and whose cheeks were flushed a lovely red and said to herself with a sigh she could grace a pretty home and a becoming dress then in the next breath but what a temptation they might be to her it is best as it is aloud she said i don't know i am sure dear but i think that at present it is better that it is ben who is to go instead of you of course it is said line coolly because you see i couldn't have gone it is all very well for ben to go in a threadbare jacket boys can do such things and it doesn't hurt them but for me to go to judge dunmore's to breakfast in a faded calico too short for me at that is not to be thought of and it is to be hoped he has sense enough to know it and then mrs bryant was sure that it was better for it to be ben because it was quite plain that her daughter caroline had not grace enough to meet such a duty as yet as for ben if he should live to be a hundred years old i am sure he will never forget the queer feeling he had nor the loud thumps which his heart gave as he waited in the great hall the next morning for his host to appear the smiling black man who seated him did it with such a friendly air that ben could not help wishing it had been he with whom he was to take breakfast the judge says you will be seated sir for a very few minutes and he will be at your service breakfast will be served as soon as the judge and his lady are ready all the while showing beautiful white teeth which to ben's confused vision seemed somehow a continuation of the mass of white shirt front which gleamed below them all the while bowing profusely and waving his hand toward one of the large high-backed easy chairs with which the wide old-fashioned elegant hall was lined the wide doors leading into the dining-room were thrown open and ben could have a broad view of the breakfast table and of the sideboard agleam with silver and cut glass how beautiful how perfectly beautiful it all was how line would glory in it all and how he hated it not that he hated pretty things on the contrary he felt an exultant thrill when he thought of the beautiful things there were in this world that money could buy in his heart he meant to have some of them a great many of them in fact and to know their uses and to be entirely at home with them but never for his own sake always there was a lovely background of mother and line and daisy to fill up his picture for them he meant to work and win all beautiful and costly things until then he would have been quite content to wait for a state breakfast he grew red in the face as he thought of all the embarrassments awaiting him and wondered why judge dunmore who was so great a lawyer and seemed able to almost read people's thoughts did not know that this was about the hardest thing he could have asked a boy to do while he was puzzling out an answer to this question a door behind him somewhere swung noiselessly open and judge dunmore entered End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two just common sense when benjamin foster bryant walked away from judge dunmore's door that morning he almost wondered whether he had not grown a little since he left home so much had been compressed into the last two hours 
it was hard for him to realize that only two hours had passed since he saw his mother he remembered that he had agreed with line to come back and get a piece of her johnny cake he laughed over the thought johnny cake was the last thing he wanted just now hungry he certainly was not although he had not expected to eat a dozen mouthfuls at the judge's table and was not at this moment aware whether he had eaten much or little his appetite was undoubtedly satisfied the steak had been so juicy that it was impossible after the first taste to help taking another and another and by the time the third mouthful was reached he had become so interested in what judge dunmore was telling that he ate right along without thinking much more about it turning the corner he came almost upon rufus kedwin before he saw him hello said that young person have you gone blind or are you studying how to make another machine like the one which has bewitched you i'll be thumped if you haven't it along do you take it with you when you go on errands ben laughed pleasantly did i run into you he asked i was so busy thinking that i never even heard your step oh no i don't take my machine along generally this morning was an exception though i fancy it will often walk out with me after this what this are you talking about where have you been you would never guess said ben his round face breaking into a broad smile i've been out to breakfast old fellow and a good breakfast we had too did you ever eat california peaches i can tell you they are prime out to breakfast where at judge dunmore's bah said rufus with a look of intense disgust on his face what's the use in chaffing a fellow so early in the season it isn't april fool yet and if it were i'm too old a bird to be caught with such a silly fool as that why don't you tell me in plain english what you mean i used as plain english as i could and i told you the exact truth i have been taking breakfast with judge dunmore and his wife i went because i was invited and we had a splendid breakfast california peaches and all how came you to asked rufus whose mouth was wide open now as well as his ears i mean how came he to invite you what does it all mean well i'll be switched if you aren't a lucky fellow this was rufus's final exclamation as by means of much cross-questioning he at last understood the whole matter i don't think there is any luck about it said ben growing dignified i learned to write on a machine when i had a chance and you didn't learn though you had the same chance and because i knew how to write on that one i had a small one given to me which you said you wouldn't have for a present if you couldn't have a large one you didn't care for any and i learned to write on that and got a chance by the means to do some work on it for judge dunmore where's your luck about that i call it luck who would have supposed that a man and a big lawyer at that would ever want work done on such a baby machine i thought it was only a plaything for daisy ben laughed good-humouredly he could afford to laugh even though his treasure was called a baby machine hadn't it earned twenty-five cents this very morning with a chance to repeat the experiment to-morrow morning who did you suppose would care how small a machine was if it could do the work he asked i should consider that an advantage just as you would let me tell you if you had to lug around one of the large machines they are a trifle heavier than this well said rufus mournfully if i'd had the least idea it would ever amount to anything i should have learned to clatter the old thing when mr reynolds told me i might i wouldn't mind earning a quarter i know in that way or most any other i haven't had a cent of spending money since christmas and only fifty cents then ben tried to think when he had had fifty cents for spending money and could not but this he said nothing about i'll tell you what it is he said speaking earnestly i've told you you made a mistake don't you know i have in not learning things when you had a chance 
they fit in somehow when you don't expect them to i wasn't sure of course that learning to run that machine would ever do me any good but i meant to try for it so long as i had the chance and you see how it has turned out it isn't luck it is just common sense now look here i'll make you an offer you can learn to run this little fellow i'll give you a chance if you will come over to our house evenings regularly we'll divide up the evenings line will work on it half an hour and i'll take it half an hour and you may have half an hour and the rest of the time we'll each work on our lessons and recite together wouldn't that be a good plan rufus shrugged his shoulders catch me studying an hour every evening he said i go to school all day i suppose you know and get studying enough i can tell you i forgot you were in school said ben his face grave his tone almost respectful it was necessary to have a little respect for a boy who could go to school all day but then of course you have to study some evenings line and i used to of course i don't catch me studying evenings after tugging at books all day a fellow has to have some time to himself well then you can have the first half hour and leave if you want to or the second half hour or the third whichever you like and we'll run races on the thing and see who can get up the highest rate of speed or which one can write the most pages without a mistake in them that is after you learn of course it doesn't take long to learn there was no lighting up of rufus's face it wouldn't be of any use he said gloomily two machines are not given away in the same town and if they were there's no work here for machines judge dunmore won't be here but a few weeks and when he goes your machine will be on your hands and you will have had all your trouble for nothing ben could not help laughing what a hopeless croaker rufus was always sighing about chances and luck and saying if i only had still he would make one more attempt you never can tell he said sagely whether a thing will work or not unless you try it i don't ask you to give up a better chance to try this one i just propose that you take some of the time which belongs to you and learn a new thing that may help in the future or it may not now do you want to do it i don't believe i do though you are a good-natured fellow to plan it some boys would not let anybody else touch their things if there was the ghost of a chance for making any money i'd go into it quicker than lightning but you see i know there isn't i believe in a fellow's using his common sense about such things besides i could not learn to do any work that would amount to shucks on such a baby affair don't i tell you i have earned a quarter on it this morning and have a chance to earn one each morning for a week at least asked ben growing indignant at last oh well that's because you had a chance at the big machine and got your hand in line didn't have a chance at the big one and she's learning to write fast oh line she's only a girl she can write fast enough for girls of course what will they ever want to write that needs speed you talk like an idiot declared ben losing his patience utterly but rufus did not want to vex him just yet and answered quickly why i don't mean anything disagreeable about line i mean that girls do not need to work as fast as boys girls have to be taken care of and worked for you know don't your mother and mine have to work rufus kedwin and they were both girls once suppose they hadn't learned when they had a chance though i don't mean that my mother shall have to work when i am a man that's just it i'm going to support my mother too and do it in style none of your little seven by nine houses for me i mean to have one as big as the sutherlands what was the use in being vexed with a boy who used so little of his boasted common sense and withal was so good-hearted ben laughed again and concluded to let it all go but rufus had a plan which needed his help i'll tell you what he began earnestly you are such a good fellow that i'm going to ask a favor of you i want you to lend me a quarter there's a special reason why i want one worse than i ever did in my life i do believe 
if i knew a single chance for earning a cent i wouldn't bother you but i don't and now that you are in the way of earning so much i thought perhaps ben interrupted him i can't lend money rufus it is part of my bargain with mother that i would neither lend nor borrow that is unless i told her all about it and she agreed if it is something you want to explain to mother and she can spare the quarter why we'll talk about it i don't want to borrow of her said rufus stiffly i thought you said the money was your own why of course it is my own didn't i earn it but man alive what do you suppose i earned it for do you think i let my mother support the family and pocket my earnings to amuse myself with why even daisy little mouse as she is knows better than that oh for pity's sake ben don't preach a sermon with every breath i know you are a perfect pattern of a boy and all that never spend a cent for a stick of candy unless you ask your mother but i thought you could accommodate a friend without running home to ask your ma if you might if rufus had not been troubled and vexed he would have known better than to expect to accomplish anything by using that sort of argument with ben his face flushed a little but he was cool and good-humoured all right he said then you are mistaken in me and may as well own it your common sense didn't work this time i'm just that sort of a chap i shall run home and ask my ma before i lend you one cent to say nothing of twenty-five of them you may depend upon that and moreover likewise i shall explain to her why i want to lend it and why you want to borrow it before she will agree to the bargain that's another thing you can depend upon and if you thought i would be ashamed of such an arrangement why that is mistake number two suppose it is a secret said rufus in an eager and conciliatory tone he was already sorry he had put his hoped-for quarter in jeopardy by losing his temper um said ben musingly we don't think much of secrets any of us unless it is about christmas or birthday times if it is anything of that kind rufus i know just how you feel but i wouldn't now honest i've been there myself and i know mothers pretty well and i know they would rather go without a present five times over than to have it bought with borrowed money and it isn't because i don't want to lend it either oh botheration you are too stupid and old fogey and green for anything it isn't about a present my mother doesn't have any birthdays not that i ever heard of and she wouldn't thank me to borrow money to make her a present you are right enough there say ben i'll pay you interest on the quarter ten per cent come now you are all for making money and you are willing to make it a quarter of a cent at a time here's a chance for you i don't think you ought to pay interest on money said ben when you haven't an idea where the principal is to come from beside what is the use in talking didn't i tell you that mother and i had a bargain about such things is it something you are willing to explain to her why yes it is if it comes to that you may explain to all creation if you want to and keep your old quarter besides i want to go to the circus barnum's circus that is coming next week and i mean to do it too whether you are too mean to let me have the money or not so now run home and tell your ma i kept you on the corner talking and that is why you are so late i suppose you have to tell her every time you turn around don't you every single solitary time said ben in utmost good humor but rufus you are a sillier boy than i thought if you meant to spend twenty-five cents to go to a show when you told me yourself you couldn't join the history class because your mother couldn't afford a book for you this year a quarter would go a good way towards buying a second-hand history and you are greener than i take you to be if you think my mother will agree to any such borrowing as that well said rufus sullenly you are meaner than i took you to be i thought you would be glad for the chance to help a fellow along who never has any fun when you could as well as not but a boy who takes breakfast with a judge can't be supposed to care to help an old acquaintance i suppose 
i'll remember in the future how accommodating you are i shall go to that circus you see if i don't and i'll get a chance for you to go too if i can anyhow i'll return good for evil that's right said ben good-naturedly i wish you success in earning the money and common sense to spend it after it is earned i wouldn't waste any of it on the circus if i were you i know that and having reached the corner where their ways separated he ran off without further ceremony while he is on his way home i may as well tell you how the plans for the fair were progressing it is true that very little time had passed since the plan was first thought of yet much work had been done toward getting ready for it what is very strange when one stops to think of it carefully much work was being done for it by those who knew nothing about it for instance there was a plain little room in a back street of a large city where sat a middle-aged woman with a plain pleasant face sewing industriously she was not by any means alone all around her lying in heaps sitting in rows standing in corners sleeping in boxes were dolls of every size and shape and complexion dolls with arms and dolls without arms dolls with hair and bald-headed dolls in fact there were dolls with no heads at all miss perkins arrested her busy needle and looked about her once or twice thoughtfully pushing out of hearing as far as possible a little sigh which wanted to come out into the room the smile which was so generally on her face faded a little and she really tried to look sober and think in fact she did more than think she held at arm's length the doll whose head she was sewing fast to its shoulders and thoughtfully studied its face as she said what in the world am i to do with you when i get you done that is the question and i'm sure i don't know how to answer it not only you but dozens of others like you it is a mercy you do not have to eat for a living that is at present my one comfort in life but then if you don't i do and i cannot eat you i'm sure i don't understand how there could ever be cannibals i couldn't eat even my kid and cloth children i believe not if it should save my life but it is getting to be pretty serious business for you and me i must say if i don't sell one of you before the week is out it is difficult to tell what will become of any of us after which the sigh really did get out and floated through the room among those staring children who did not care at all miss perkins felt the lack of sympathy if there had only been somebody to say poor miss perkins i am certain she would have felt better and would not have let that one tear roll down over her nose and plash on the needle she was pushing through a kid arm at the moment i mean if she could have realized that there was one who cared generally miss perkins did realize this and it is what made her smiles bright and steady even through trying days and weeks you have guessed before that this miss perkins made her living by making dollies that is she sewed for a large firm who employed her whenever they wanted extra help they could not take her regularly into their factory because she could not be taken she kept this one room and kept it home-like and kept a few of the old home things about it for the sake of a troublesome little nephew whose only friend she was and who repaid all her sacrifice by being almost as bad a boy as he could and wasting his little earnings in chewing gum and cigarettes if i were you i would send him to some home miss perkins so her friends often said to her and miss perkins would shake her head and say i have i've sent him to my home poor little fellow if there isn't room in my heart for him there isn't anywhere i promised my sister with her last breath that i'd look after him as long as there was life in me and i mean to do it so miss perkins would not break up her little home and go to the factory and it happened sometimes that very little extra work was needed and on this particular winter dory the naughty nephew had tumbled from a scaffolding where he ought never to have been 
and broken his leg and required much care and some luxuries and times were harder than usual miss perkins during the five years in which she had been an extra hand for the firm had gathered about her many scraps of kid and cloth and many heads of dollies slightly marred in some way and so thrown out as imperfect and had set up a wee manufactory of her own making dollies to order the only trouble was the orders were few and far between only a few of her friends knew about this and they belonged to the class who do not spend much money for dolls it came to pass in the course of time that miss perkins had boxes and boxes of unfinished dolls some needing an arm when the kid gave out just at the wrong minute some with their heads only basted on because an order had come before they were finished this particular spring times were duller than usual and miss perkins who had been without work for three weeks other than these dollies afforded had finally gathered them all about her to discover in a systematic way if she could what was needed End of chapter 22